Hey, welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show on Reason and Theology. Let's talk about Sola Scriptura versus what is sometimes attributed to Catholics, known as Sola Ecclesia. We're going to define what these terms mean and if Catholics actually even believe in Sola Ecclesia. And if so, okay, what is it? If not, what do we believe? So that's what's in store for us today. Before we dive in, I want to remind you, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and the like button while you're at it. This has resurfaced again because of the recent debate between James White and Trent Horn. We've often heard from some Protestant apologists, especially James White, that Catholics believe what's called sola um, ecclesia, which would just mean in Latin translated into English, only the church, right? Um, in the same way that in Latin, sola scriptura would mean only scripture. But we have to define what we mean by these terms. And if this is even accurate, if this is even something that Catholics hold to, I want to share my screen and you can see somebody recently asked me about this <clears throat> because of the debate. This gentleman comments and says, Mike, I heard James White accuse Catholics of bling sola ecclesia. Could you maybe address this in your review of the debate and how to respond? God bless. Well, I'll certainly have a review coming up next week on the debate. Um, but I wanted to sneak this one in as far as just a response to the question of sola scriptura, since it deserves its own show. Now, let me show you where this was brought up in the Sola Scriptura debate. I'll just play a very brief clip. Um, Sola Scriptura, I'm sorry, Sola Ecclesia, unfortunately, wasn't necessarily defined, at least not very clearly here, by James White in the debate. Um, but we see him bring it up and says this is basically what Catholics and even others hold to. Let's, uh, what, let's watch it together. Let me... Um, again, share my screen, make sure that you can hear the audio, and we'll watch this brief clip. Or any statement intended to mislead could find a place. I know the volume is very low. Unfortunately, it, it seems like both of the debates are very low in volume. So we have two positions, sola scriptura and sola ecclesia, or has been suggested by some younger friends of mine, leave the Latin out of it and compare scripturalism versus ecclesialism. Ecclesialism would include Rome, the various Orthodox groups, Greek, Russian, Ukrainian, etc., Assyrian Church of the East, Oriental groups, all of who claim to possess authoritative oral tradition and a magisterial power to interpret and bind, and most of them claim some charism of infallibility for themselves. So Rome is not alone in that, but we don't have any representatives from those folks here this evening who are debating, so we just simply point out that it's not simply a default, that if you say Sola Scriptura is not true, therefore we must be the ones that then get to uh, take the mantle. Well, what he described there wouldn't actually be um, Sola Ecclesia. Um, and I would also contest whether those other groups actually have a magisterium and teach that they have a magisterium that can teach infallibly, because in, in fact, um, that is incredibly um, contested especially with the um, Eastern Orthodox. And so um, I, would, I would certainly challenge him on that point. Be that as it may, for Catholics, we do have a magisterium. We do believe that it can teach infallibly. Uh, so at the very least, when he speaks of those things, that applies to Catholicism. But the way he described the two options here, sola scriptura and sola ecclesia, and then he goes on to define what he means by sola ecclesia, that doesn't sound like sola ecclesia to me because of the a pesky little word in there called sola, uh, which means alone. So that's what um, creates some disconnect, which I'll demonstrate to you right now. In fact, <clears throat> let me show you my screen and let's maybe go over some basic terminology and then I'll go into what Catholics believe and then whether or not that's sola ecclesia and whether or not that even maps on to what James White even said Sola Ecclesia is, at least in that clip. Uh, so here we go. <clears throat> Let me maybe zoom in a little bit more on that. Okay. 
So there's often a straw man made about Protestants. Now, in, in fairness, this does apply to some Protestants, but maybe um, maybe not your more educated and informed Protestants. And so for your more educated and informed Protestants, this would be a straw man for them. But <clears throat> for some of the uh, less educated uh, Protestants, this actually isn't a straw man. This is true. But for someone like, you know, James White, he's going to feel like this is a straw man. Okay. So let's consider what is potentially a straw man of the Protestant position whenever we speak of sola scriptura. There's what's called solo scriptura versus sola scriptura. And then we're going to compare that to Catholicism. So solo scriptura means there is one infallible rule for the Christian on matters of faith and morals, um, which is sacred scripture, the Bible. Um, and there are no other rules of faith, even those that are fallible. So a solo scripture of you says Bible and Bible alone, not only when it comes to what is infallible, but also just what is to inform me about faith and morals. So church councils and things like that doesn't even matter what they say because they're not a rule of faith for the Christian, even a fallible rule of faith. They, they don't come into play at all. That's a so low scripture of you. Again, that is not the position of generally your magisterial reformers during the Reformation. It's not the position of your more educated Protestants today. It certainly is not the position of James White. Um, so for people like that, if you describe sola scriptura as solo scriptura, they would say, hey, that's a straw man. But in reality, it does actually apply to some Protestants. Okay. Now, there's what's called, again, sola scriptura as opposed to solo scriptura. And your more educated Protestants are going to say sola scriptura means there is only one infallible rule of faith for the Christian to inform us on how we are to live, and that is Scripture. So just like the solo Scriptura, they say, yes, only one infallible rule of faith. But they'll say, but there are other rules of faith that help us help inform the Christian on how they're to live. However, they are fallible rules, right? They're not infallible. One example they would say would be an ecumenical council, maybe the Council of Nicaea. They wouldn't say, well, you know, it's it's an infallible standard in and of itself. They'll say no, um, but what it witnesses to, which is Scripture, Scripture is infallible. And so insofar as it witnesses to Scripture, it's infallible, but not because infallibility is actually native to the council, but because it's simply pointing us to that infallible rule, which is sacred Scripture. Okay, so they say only one infallible rule but there are other fallible rules. They could be in there. Um, however, they might be useful. We just have to keep in mind we can't give them, uh, give them an infallibility in the way that we can with Scripture. So that's the difference between sola scriptura, lo scriptura. Now, it's important for you to really focus on sola scriptura here as we now transition to Sola Ecclesia. Sola Scriptura says there are multiple rules of faith, but only one of them is infallible. So if you were to speak of Sola Ecclesia, you would think that means there's only one infallible rule of faith, but there might be other fallible rules of faith. It's just there's only one infallible rule of faith, and that is the Ecclesia, the church, right? So, in, in other words, if you properly are representing what someone like James White believes sola scriptura is, if you flip it around, sola ecclesia, if we're being fair, would mean there's one infallible rule. That is the magisterium or the church. And there are other rules that do exist, but they are fallible in nature. Okay. So, again. Sola Scriptura, one infallible rule, it's the Bible. There are other rules of faith, but they are fallible. That would then mean Sola Ecclesia would be 
There's only one infallible rule, the church, the magisterium, but there are other fallible rules, right? Okay, that's what sola ecclesia should be if we are representing things accurately. Now, do Catholics believe sola ecclesia as I just defined it, which is frankly the only fair definition of what it could mean? when you compare it to what a Protestant would say a fair definition of sola scriptura is. Do Catholics believe in this notion of sola scriptura? No. No, absolutely not. And one huge thing that should be jumping out at you right now is, wait, don't Catholics believe not only the magisterium is infallible, but also the Bible and sacred tradition are infallible too? Right. Exactly. So we don't believe in one infallible rule of faith. And we don't believe that that one infallible rule of faith is the church. This is not a Catholic position. What we believe is there are three main rules of faith, and all three are infallible. So what Catholics actually believe is Scripture, tradition, and the magisterium are infallible rules of faith. There's no sola here. There's no sola. So whenever you hear someone say Catholics believe sola ecclesia, that is a straw man. In the exact same way that if I were to say James White believes solo scriptura, he would be offended and you would say, wait, that's a straw man. That's not my position. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So you adhere to sola scriptura, not solo scriptura. Okay. But don't then attribute to us sola ecclesia, because we don't believe there's only one infallible rule of faith. We don't believe that. We believe there are three infallible rules of faith. Scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium. Now, I want to explain to you the relationship between scripture, tradition, and the magisterium in Catholicism, because I help. I, I think this will help people better understand the Catholic position because they might say, well, you guys claim to believe there are three infallible rules of faith. And in that sense, you're not sola ecclesia, but practically you guys are sola ecclesia only in so far as you collapse scripture and tradition only into what the magisterium says. So at the end of the day, it only matters what the magisterium says. Um, now, I would say even practically, that is not true. That is also a caricature of the Catholic position. And so let me explain to you what the Catholic position is so that we can avoid these straw men. And if somebody says, hey, you guys believe in sola ecclesia, you can always then explain to them, hey, that's not accurate, and here's why. Okay. Now, we believe there is something known as divine revelation. You know, um, God has revealed himself and his will for us. That's divine revelation. And the book of Hebrews says that divine revelation is a person. It's Jesus Christ. And that person, Jesus Christ, witnesses uh, to us in his um, actions. 2,000 years ago in the Incarnation, and also in his teachings. So God has revealed to us who he is, what he expects of us. It's been fully revealed in Jesus Christ, and that which he has revealed we call the deposit of faith. You could call it divine revelation. Um, but we would say this has been transmitted to us in two modes. And, and what I mean by transmitted to us is us alive today. We receive divine revelation from God through these two modes, because God is not currently speaking to an author of sacred scripture alive today, right? You no longer have any uh, further divine revelation after the death of the last apostle. 
So how do we get that divine revelation today? How do, how do we hear about it? How do we learn it? Well, it's transmitted to us in two different modes, two different ways. Sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Now, in a sense, we can actually conflate those two together, absolutely speaking, which you'll see here in a moment. Sacred scripture is what we would say is divine revelation that has been written down. So what God has revealed, divine revelation that has been written down, inscripturated, that's sacred scripture. So that's one of the modes of transmitting divine revelation to us today and throughout the ages. The second is sacred tradition. Now, hmm. There's a lot going on with this one, and this is where a lot of misunderstanding comes into play. So we're going to have to focus on this for a minute. Sacred Scripture, pretty straightforward. It's that which is written down. But sacred tradition, on the other hand, there's different aspects to this. This is divine revelation that is transmitted, number one, by sacred Scripture. Yes, um, sacred scripture is an artifact of sacred tradition. Sacred tradition is prior to the writing down of scripture. The truth, the teaching was already there even before some of the New Testament was written down. The gospel of Jesus Christ was being proclaimed prior to some of the gospels and epistles being written down. So sacred tradition and that mode of communicating divine revelation actually precedes in some cases, sacred scripture. In some cases, I say. Uh, because there's obviously exceptions with some parts of the Old Testament and things like that. Okay. But it's divine revelation that is transmitted by sacred scripture, but also other modes through the preaching of the word, through the sacred liturgy. The sacred liturgy is a vehicle that carries the tradition of the church. Preaching is a vehicle that carries the tradition of the church. The church fathers are vehicles that carry this tradition. They are not synonymous with sacred tradition, no, but they do carry it. They do transmit it. They do pass it on in their writings. The sense of the faithful testifies to sacred tradition. We don't create it. We're not the author of it, but we transmit it. We communicate it to future generations, and we also witness to it even today. So even sacred art, to an extent, transmits sacred tradition. So sacred tradition is divine revelation, but it's transmitted by sacred scripture and even other modes, preaching, liturgy, church fathers, sense of the faithful, sacred art, and others. Now, sacred tradition is not church traditions or ecclesial traditions. These would be something like a sacramental, the rosary. Um, these are traditions that the church has come up with, not as divine revelation, but as just something useful to the faithful. Now, this can change. The church can change ecclesial traditions be, precisely because they are not divine revelation. It's not the deposit of faith. It might just help us live the faith out better. There's also what's called human apostolic traditions. Um, we receive... Divine revelation through Jesus Christ, dominical tradition, but also we received divine revelation through the apostles. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not all sacred tradition immediately came from the words of our Lord, but in fact, in some cases, it was an apostle who communicated that divine revelation. And we would say that's called divine apostolic tradition because it's divine insofar as it originates in God. It's apostolic insofar as it's communicated through the apostles. And it's tradition since it's tradition. That's pretty straightforward. But, and by the way, tradition means handing down. 
there is something else called human apostolic traditions. These are traditions. These are things and practices that are handed down from the apostles. So they're apostolic traditions, but they're human in origin. They're not divine. God did not reveal them in the deposit of faith. A human apostolic tradition would be um, the uh, when to celebrate Easter, for example. Different apostles held the different uh, practices here. So some traced their time for when they celebrate Easter, going back to this apostle and others had a different time and they traced that practice back to another apostles. And it's because God did not reveal when Easter is to be celebrated. It's not part of divine revelation, but it is apostolic in nature insofar as some of these times for us to celebrate Easter, some of these different disciplines or practices did originate in different apostles. These are, again, human apostolic traditions, and they can be changed. The church can change them. Why? Because they're human in nature, not divine. So sacred tradition is not a human apostolic tradition or ecclesial tradition. It is rather divine dominical tradition or divine apostolic tradition. It is not human apostolic tradition. Don't get those things confused. Most people do, and that's where we start to get a breakdown in um, understanding. Moving forward with sacred tradition, sacred tradition, personally, I would argue, and, and I think the um, witness of many church fathers would argue, is that sacred tradition does not add material to divine revelation that is not already found in sacred scripture. In other words, the material of what God has revealed in divine revelation has been fully written down in scripture. That's just the raw material, the Lego pieces. But the interpretation or the meaning, putting the Lego pieces together into a ship versus putting the Lego pieces together into a car, the meaning, the interpretation, that is transmitted through other modes. And that is also what we would call sacred tradition. So again, all of the building blocks of divine revelation has been put down into Scripture. It's been inscripturated, but the precise meaning, the correct interpretation, because there's a difference between what the Scripture says and how we are to understand it. The how we are to understand it is something that we have to look to sacred tradition for. After all, I mean, you could come to all sorts of passages in divine scripture and, and, and um, you know, come to completely different conclusions. You know, when Jesus talks about uh, cutting off your arm or taking out your eye if it causes you to stumble, do we interpret that as literal? We actually need to go and do this? Or, or should we understand this in some kind of uh, more metaphorical way? Well, we're going to have to have something that can um, answer that question. You know, what was the intention behind that? Did Jesus in intend us to understand this literalistically or maybe metaphorically? Well, the role of sacred tradition is going to help fill in the blank there, help fill in the gap and give us that meaning. So the raw data is there. Jesus said, cut off your arm. But what that means that's when sacred tradition comes into play. Sacred tradition is both a vehicle for transmitting divine revelation. It also is divine revelation. And it is what gives meaning or the correct interpretation to Scripture. Let me maybe add that, that point here. Let's see. Let's see. Rephrase it here. Sacred tradition has several aspects here, here. And this is where I think so many people have a breakdown and they get their wires crossed and they, they don't follow conversations because they're thinking of sacred tradition in one way only. And you have to understand there's various ways in which we can speak about sacred tradition. Sacred scripture 
is divine revelation. Is. It is divine revelation. But we can also speak of sacred scripture as a vehicle for transmitting divine revelation, how it's brought to us today. And that's partly through sacred scripture, right? Because sacred tradition we have being put down into writings. It's also transmitted to us today through those other modes that we saw earlier, church fathers and so on. But it is also what gives meaning to divine revelation, especially sacred scripture. So it gives meaning especially to the correct interpretation of sacred scripture. So you need to think of sacred tradition in these different ways. All three aspects. Divine revelation itself, a vehicle for transmitting divine revelation, and what gives meaning to sacred scripture. So what you might say to be the form of scripture. Sacred Scripture contains all of the matter. It's materially sufficient. But that form, the correct interpretation, the correct meaning is brought on by sacred tradition. Now, this also means that if all manuscripts of the Bible and if all other attestations to Scripture itself were to disappear tomorrow, so you wipe from the face of planet Earth all Bibles, all manuscripts of the Old and New Testament, all lectionaries, any reference to, you know, any actual quotes of sacred scripture by a church father or any human for that matter, all direct quotes of the Bible. You eliminate them from the face of the Earth tomorrow. Even so we would still fully have divine revelation as it is still intact in sacred tradition through these other modes that carry them, the preaching of the gospel, liturg the liturgy, art, the sense of the faithful, and so on. Those would still carry the content of divine revelation. Now, it's much more convenient to have it all written down in Scripture, right? <laughs> uh, so we don't want to um, undermine the importance of having sacred Scripture. But strictly speaking, if all um, references to Scripture were destroyed overnight, we would still have the fullness of the faith. We would still have all of the deposit of faith, all of the content that God has revealed, in sacred tradition in those other modes that have preserved it. Now, to emphasize again, sacred tradition is chronologically prior to sacred scripture because, again, at least in some cases, right? Because, again, the preaching of the gospel was there available prior to the writing of John. Now, you might say, well, the writing of Ezekiel, <laughs> um, that aspect of sacred tradition was um, simultaneous with his writing down of that revelation, perhaps. I don't know. I mean, I suppose Ezekiel maybe had some of those revelations before he wrote them down. And so maybe even then you could speak of sacred tradition being prior to sacred scripture. But. Sacred scripture is to be given a privileged position due to its accessibility. And you can find this in guys like Emmanuel Duranzo in his work, Channels of Revelation, uh, where in Channels of Revelation he speaks of sacred scripture um, as proper, primary, privileged an independent theological place. Why is it privileged? Why is it primary? Why is sacred scripture primary over sacred tradition? And here we mean sacred tradition as understood as the mode in which it's transmitted, divine revelation is transmitted, and also um, 
the correct meaning, right? The correct interpretation. Why is sacred scripture itself to be given a privileged position? Well, it's because of its accessibility. It's very easy to just open up your Bible and consult your Bible on a theological question compared to searching through the sacred liturgies, searching through sacred art, searching through determining the sense of the faithful. I'm not saying those things can't be done. Of course they can. But those are a little less immediately accessible. Those are a little bit more remote in some cases. Maybe maybe not in others, but in some cases, that's more remote, at least for a person who's literate. Uh, scripture might be a more accessible. So if you ask the question, is Jesus the Messiah? I mean, I could just, bam, you know, open up the, the New Testament, open up the Gospel of Matthew. It's pretty pretty straightforward right there. Uh, whereas if I want to ask that same question and consult sacred art, it might take a lot longer. Uh, or if I want to uh, consult the sacred liturgy, the holy liturgy, to answer that same question, it might take a little longer. So scripture has greater accessibility in some cases. Now, there's also what's called the magisterium, that, uh, that third rule of faith. So far, we discussed two of them, scripture and tradition. I showed you how, in some ways, they're synonymous, um, and in other ways, we can distinguish between the two. Um, but there's also, again, this other rule of faith that is infallible for Catholics. It's called the magisterium. This is the teaching authority of the church. And it derives its authority from Jesus Christ. You can see that witness to in the New Testament. But even prior to that being written down, Jesus had already commissioned certain leaders in the church. And these leaders laid hands on other leaders and commissioned them. And then those leaders laid hands on other leaders and commissioned them. That teaching authority was already there, but it goes back to Jesus Christ. And Christ today rules through his magisterium. We speak of the total Christ, the whole Christ, not just the head, the person, the second person of the Trinity, but also his body, the body of Christ. That's the whole Christ, the second person of the Trinity and the mystical body. That's the whole Christ. Well, Christ rules through his magisterium because he doesn't function ordinarily apart from the body of Christ. So there's exceptions. There's definitely exceptions. But for the most part, ordinarily, he works through the magisterium, through that church, through the teaching authority within that church, the whole Christ. Now, this magisterium gives an authoritative judgment on the extent of Scripture. In fact, not only has it given us an authoritative judgment, it's given an infallible judgment on the extent of Scripture. Um, so it has given us the canon, the canon meaning, meaning rule, you know, which books belong in the Bible, the table of contents. Well, of course, in one sense, God gives us that canon. The church doesn't come up with the canon in that sense. It's God who comes up with it. But how do we know what God came up with? Well, it's the church that testifies to, here's the books that God uh, determines are canonical, and here's the ones that aren't canonical. It's, it's, a, it's a testimony of the church. The church doesn't create the canon, but it testifies to what it is. And it has testified not only authoritatively with the authority of Jesus Christ, but infallibly so. Now, <clears throat> it also gives us an authoritative judgment and can give us an authoritative judgment on the meaning of divine revelation found in sacred scripture and sacred tradition. And not only can it give an authoritative judgment, it can also give an infallible judgment, because, again, we believe it's an infallible rule of faith. 
Sometimes it gives a tentative judgment. It's authoritative, but it's not yet. Um, it doesn't speak with the full weight of infallibility. And in other cases, it does go ahead and say, okay, no, full weight of infallibility. This is it. But its role is to give authoritative judgments. Authoritative judgment means it has the backing of Christ. It has the authority of Christ when it judges. Do I have that authority from Jesus Christ in the way the magisterium does? No, because where did Jesus pers personally commission me? He never did. He never commissioned me personally to do certain things. He might commission all Christians, generally speaking, to preach the gospel, to do some general things, but he never personally commissioned me to give authoritative and binding judgments for the rest of the church. If I give in a judgment on Scripture, that's my personal judgment. You're not bound to it. However, when the church gives an authoritative judgment, it does bind your conscience because it speaks with the authority of Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus gave the church that authority, first of all, directly to his apostles. And then those apostles gave it to their successors. So you can say Jesus indirectly gives to every bishop today authority to teach in the magisterium as a whole, authority to teach and the authority to bind consciences. So the magisterium, the Pope, and the College of Bishops, when it teaches universally and it speaks then authoritatively, it has that ability to bind consciences because it's authoritative in nature. As opposed to you and I, when we teach about Scripture, when we teach about um, the faith, we can do so, but not in a way that can bind anyone else's conscience. I can't bind you to my interpretation. However, if the magisterium gives an authoritative interpretation of Scripture and sacred tradition, it can bind your conscience because, again, it speaks with the authority of Jesus Christ. Thus, it's authoritative. So we can speak of the difference between an authoritative interpretation versus a private interpretation. And over and over, what you'll see is the magisterium has said that it belongs to the magisterium alone, not to interpret Scripture, but to authoritatively interpret Scripture. You see, there's a difference. There's a difference between privately interpreting Scripture and authoritatively interpreting Scripture. So we're going to take a look at that here in just a second. So, all Catholics, we can go straight to Scripture to consult it on matters of faith and morals. We can go directly to the Bible. The church, in fact, encourages us to do that. All Catholics can go straight to Scripture since it has priority, since it's primary, as we saw. You should go, first of all, to sacred Scripture if you have a question on faith and morals. You go first to Scripture. Again, the church determines the extent of the canon. Once you have that magisterium that has determined it, what belongs in the canon, then you could go to that canon. We can also go to sacred tradition. We can consult aspects of the liturgy. We can consult um, various writings of the church fathers and so on. We can go directly to those things. And we can interpret them with a private judgment. This is where a lot of Catholics misunderstand. They think that Catholicism is completely opposed to private judgment. Both Catholics and Protestants have this misunderstanding in many cases. No. The church is not against private judgment per se. However, Catholics cannot interpret Scripture or tradition contrary to the Church's authoritative judgment. So, it's not that the Church is against private judgment of Scripture for the average Catholic per se, but that private judgment of yours can never, ever, or should never, 
overrule or go against the authoritative judgment of the church when it interprets scripture. So my private judgment gives way to an authoritative judgment and an authoritative interpretation of the magisterium. But if one has not been offered, then I am free as a Catholic to consult scripture, to consult sacred tradition, through the modes in which it has been transmitted to us today and give my best judgment. It's a private judgment. Yes, I can't bind your conscience to it. I get it. But I can make that private judgment unless the church overrules it with an authoritative judgment. At that point, it binds my conscience and I must assent to it. However, as you likely know, the magisterium in the vast majority of cases has not offered an intervention. So, you know, um, it leaves a lot of freedom for us to do our own private uh, journey in understanding the faith. It does give us guidelines. It gives us parameters. It tells us how to engage in that private judgment. Um, and it does give us some guardrails and it says, look, here's the, the boundaries. Don't go past this. But it does leave a lot of wiggle room for us. However. Well, I'll table that. I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Now, Catholics don't always need the magisterium to interpret sacred scripture. Not with an authoritative rule. Not with an authoritative judgment. We don't always need that. So any Protestant who thinks, or any Catholic for that matter, who thinks, well, unless the church has said something about it, I can't believe anything about this. Well, no, that's not the way it works. Let me give you an example. Has the church ever defined as a dogma that Jesus is the Messiah? Answer, no, it has not. But it also doesn't need to. Because Scripture, it's already determined which books belong to the canon and are part of Scripture. And that Scripture that the Magisterium uh, testifies to tells us very clearly that Jesus is the Messiah. So if you want to know, is Jesus the Messiah? It's, yeah, look, you don't need an authoritative judgment from the magisterium on that. You don't. You don't. You don't need the magisterium to weigh in on that question. You can just open up the Gospel of Matthew. The magisterium has already told you the extent of the canon. You could just open up um, sacred scripture. Anything explicitly asserted, you can know as long as you understand human language. Right. So those things that are explicitly taught in Scripture, you don't need the church to interpret those for you if they're explicitly taught. However, as we know, a lot of things aren't explicitly taught. Some things are implied. And as you know, some things are theological conclusions from Scripture. Um, and as you know, some things are sometimes obscure in Scripture. They're prophecy. They're harder to interpret and understand. So not everything is always explicit in Scripture. Not everything is always clear-cut. Sometimes it is. We don't want to go to the opposite extreme and pretend that you can't understand anything about the Scripture unless the church tells you what, what to believe. That's a straw man that Protestants believe about Catholics. And unfortunately, it's because some Catholics actually believe that straw man. <laughs> it's sad. No, no, there are some things the church doesn't have to interpret for you. However, Catholics do need the magisterium to offer an authoritative judgment once there is a serious dispute among Catholics between two competing judgments of Scripture and tradition. So if you have one Catholic who says, well, my understanding of Scripture is this, and another one says, well, my understanding of Scripture is, is that, or my understanding of tradition is this, and the other one says, well, my understanding of tradition is that, and then they have a difference here, if that difference becomes so problematic that it's disrupting order in the church, at that point we do need the magisterium to intervene, and the magisterium can and should intervene. Sometimes it doesn't, unfortunately which that means that sometimes the magisterium or the members of the magisterium are being negligent in their duties. However, 
they have that ability, they have that commission, they have that duty, whether or not they exercise it in a timely fashion is a different question. But we need them to settle this dispute. If, if two different theologians have really great arguments for two very different positions, and they're both appealing to Scripture and sacred tradition, um, and coming to two different conclusions, and this difference is disrupting the unity of the body of Christ and is creating problems and tensions in the church and is misleading souls, yeah, we need the magisterium to intervene and offer, at the very least, an authoritative judgment, if not an infallible judgment. At the very least, something to bind our conscience, even if it's non-infallible, something that would bind our consciences to settle the matter, at least tentatively, if not an infallible judgment that indefinitely settles it. So that's when you do need the magisterium to kick in. But you don't always need it because in some cases there's just no dispute. Like there's no two, no serious Catholic can honestly dispute, is Jesus the Messiah? Like that, that no, I'm sorry. That's, that's not a serious dispute. You know, if one says Jesus is the Messiah, the other one says, no, he's not the Messiah. That's not a serious debate. Nobody should take the guy who says Jesus isn't the Messiah seriously if they're a Catholic, right? Now, moving on. Last part. Catholics can ascertain what sacred tradition is for ourselves. In other words, what the meaning of Scripture is, or what is sacred tradition. We can make a private judgment, but again, it cannot be contrary to the church's decision on the matter. So same thing with sacred tr Scripture. You would also apply that to the sacred tradition. I can offer a private judgment. I can't bind your conscience to it, but I can offer my private judgment. And I can make a private judgment for myself. But if the church rules on the matter, my private judgment has to give way to the authoritative judgment of the church. There's a lot of Catholics who are not doing that these days. There's a lot of Catholics who are taking their private judgment of Scripture and their private judgment of sacred tradition over and against the authoritative judgments of the magisterium. And that's when I say, you guys are Protestants, whether you realize it or not. You guys are Protestants, and the church is filled with it right now. There's cardinals and bishops who are at their core, they are Protestant, because they engage in this private judgment and private interpretation over and against the magisterium. That's when you've crossed the line and you've gone into Protestantism. Um, and in reality, what you should be doing is saying, okay, well, I can offer my private judgment up until the moment that the church weighs in authoritatively on the matter. At that point, I have to give way because the magisterium speaks with the voice of Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, do we as Catholics believe in sola ecclesia? No. Because sola ecclesia, if we are going to represent what it means accurately in light of what sola scriptura accurately means, it would have to mean that there's only one infallible rule, and that is the magisterium. It would have to then mean that scripture and sacred tradition are not an infallible rule for Catholics, which is absurd because we believe all three are an infallible rule. It also even goes against what we do practically, because even practically, we don't, or at least we shouldn't as Catholics, reduce ourselves to sola magisterium only what the magisterium says no you are free to explore and make judgments about what scripture and tradition says only to the extent that the church has not offered an authoritative judgment however once it has done so yes your private judgment then has to give way to the magisterium but that's not sola ecclesia that's not sola magisterium, because I'm still doing all this other work of exploring sacred scripture, which is infallible, and sacred tradition, which is infallible, prior to a formal judgment of the church. And since I believe all three rules are infallible, I don't hold to one rule of faith that's infallible, sola, nor do I believe it's just the church that's infallible, because, again, I believe scripture and tradition are also infallible, and the magisterium teaches that they're infallible. Um, so 
you can straw man, however, Catholics and say, you guys just believe in solo ecclesia. And that might actually be how some Catholics practically function insofar as they ignore scripture and they just go, well, what does the magisterium say? And they ignore everything else scripture says. And they think unless the magisterium says it, I can't know anything. So they don't ever read scripture. Well, that might be true of some Catholics, but when they do that, they're not behaving as a Catholic. So you can straw man Catholicism and say, well, I've seen some Catholics engage um, theological questions this way. OK, but when you've seen that, that's an abuse and that's not indicative of Catholicism in the same way that an educated Protestant would say solo scriptura. Maybe that is how you observe some Protestants and their theological inquiries, but that's not representative of authentic Protestantism. Okay, fair enough. Maybe that's not, in your opinion, you know, representative of authentic Catholicism. But in the case of the magisterium, the magisterium has already told us that we can explore scripture, that we can uh, read scripture. In fact, there are indulgences for reading scripture, um, that we can read the church fathers and so on, so we can uh, is explore sacred tradition for ourselves. The magisterium already testifies that we can do that. So if there is a Protestant out there, that behaves functionally as a sola ecclesia person. I don't even know what you would call that, but um, as someone who adheres to sola ecclesia, but that that's just simply not indicative of Catholicism. So it's a straw man. So again, anytime you hear a Protestant or maybe James White or somebody else like that, paint Catholics as a sola ecclesia adherence, I just think it's a misunderstanding on their part. Um, and perhaps you could then explain to them um, the content of this video and, and straighten out some of those things. You'll notice, to finalize here, you'll notice the definition that James White gave um, in that debate of sola ecclesia doesn't actually match up with what he should be saying sola ecclesia is, because he depicted sola ecclesia there, at least, as those who hold to scripture and yes tradition and the magisterium and have an infallible rule of faith with the magisterium that's still not sola ecclesia though because it's not sola because you would still have to grant that catholics hold to scripture and tradition as also infallible rules of faith and again they don't functionally collapse on themselves into the magisterium because again when the magisterium has not authoritatively spoken on a matter we can go to the infallible rule of faith found in sacred scripture and interpret it uh, privately for ourselves. So I think there is a lot of confusion on James White's part, and it's partly due to um, the fact that maybe some Catholics have actually engaged um, in theological disputes with a sola ecclesia model. But I would just simply say, yeah, that's not that's not Catholic. Uh, so it's it's really fighting against a straw man. All right. So I hope this was helpful in putting to rest this straw man. If it was, hit that like button and put it in the comment section. Let me know what you thought about this. Uh, let me know if you found it helpful. And go ahead and hit that subscribe button while you are at it. We'll see you later. God bless. Hey, friends. Do you want others to discover why the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus established? And do you want to help people make sense of all the confusion in the Catholic Church today? Help contribute to this mission by supporting Reason and Theology at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. By doing so, you'll also get access to exclusive content for patrons only. Also, if you want to deepen your faith, there are free ebooks and even courses that you can sign up for by visiting reason.podia.com. Have you ever noticed that certain Catholic teachings are classified differently? For example, some are called dogmas and others are called doctrines. And then a denial of one of these teachings might be called heretical, while a denial of another might just be called an error. In reality, there are many classifications to various teachings that may be found in the Catholic Church. In my course, The Theological Notes, I offer a crash course on this system that will prepare you to identify a teaching's classification more easily. And I'll also help you determine what level of assent or adherence you are required as a Catholic to give to a particular doctrine.
So if you would like to take this course, visit reason.podia.com.